crossing the Delaware, Trenton, and Princeton. Washington crossed the Delaware River into Pennsylvania, where Lee's replacement General John Sullivan joined him with 2,000 more troops. The future of the Continental Army was in doubt due to lack of supplies, a harsh winter, expiring enlistments, and desertions. Washington was disappointed that many New Jersey residents were loyalists or skeptical about independence. Howard split up his army and posted a Hessian garrison at Trenton to hold western New Jersey and the east shore of the Delaware. Desperate for a victory, Washington and his generals devised a surprise attack on Trenton. The army was to cross the Delaware in three divisions, one led by Washington, 2,400 troops, another by General James Ewing, 700, and the third by Colonel John Cadwallader, 1,500. The force was to then split, with Washington taking the Pennington Road and General Sullivan traveling south on the river's edge. Washington ordered a 60-mile search for Durham boats to transport his army and the destruction of vessels that could be used by the British. He personally risked capture while staking out the Jersey shoreline alone leading up to the crossing. Washington crossed the Delaware on Christmas night, 1776. His men followed across the ice, obstructed river from McConkie's Ferry with 40 men per vessel. The wind churned up the waters and they were pelted with hail, but by 3.00 a.m. on December 26, they made it across with no losses. Knox was delayed managing frightened horses and about 18 field guns on flat bottom ferries. Cadwallader and Ewing failed to cross due to the ice and heavy currents. Once Knox arrived, Washington proceeded to Trenton rather than risk being spotted returning his army to Pennsylvania. The troops spotted Hessian positions a mile from Trenton, so Washington split his force into two columns, rallying his men. Soldiers, keep by your officers. For God's sake, keep by your officers. The two columns were separated at the Birmingham crossroads. General Green's column took the upper ferry road, led by Washington, and General Sullivan's column advanced on River Road. The Americans marched in sleet and snowfall. Many were shoeless with bloodied feet, and two died of exposure. At sunrise, Washington, aided by Colonel Knox and artillery, led his men in a surprise attack on the unsuspecting Hessians and their commander, Colonel Johann Rall. The Hessians had 22 killed, including Colonel Rall, 83 wounded, and 850 captured with supplies. Washington retreated across the Delaware to Pennsylvania and returned to New Jersey on January 3, 1777, launching an attack on British regulars at Princeton, with 40 Americans killed or wounded and 273 British killed or captured. American generals Hugh Mercer and John Cadwallader were being driven back by the British when Mercer was mortally wounded. Washington arrived and led the men in a counterattack which advanced to within 30 yards, 27M, of the British line. Some British troops retreated after a brief stand, while others took refuge in Nassau Hall, which became the target of Colonel Alexander Hamilton's cannon. Washington's troops charged, the British surrendered in less than an hour, and 194 soldiers laid down their arms. Howe retreated to New York City, where his army remained inactive until early the next year. Washington took up winter headquarters in Jacob Arnold's Tavern in Morristown, New Jersey, while he received munition from the Hibernia mines. While in Morristown, Washington's troops disrupted British supply lines and expelled them from parts of New Jersey. During his stay in Morristown, Washington ordered the inoculation of Continental troops against smallpox. This went against the wishes of the Continental Congress, who had issued a proclamation prohibiting it, but Washington feared the spread of smallpox in the army. The mass inoculation proved successful, with only isolated infections occurring and no regiments incapacitated by the disease. The British still controlled New York, and many Patriot soldiers did not re-enlist or deserted after the harsh winter campaign. Congress instituted greater rewards for re-enlisting and punishments for desertion to affect greater troop numbers. Strategically, Washington's victories at Trenton and Princeton were pivotal. They revived Patriot morale and quashed the British strategy of showing overwhelming force followed by offering generous terms, changing the course of the war. In February 1777, word of the American victories reached London and the British realized the Patriots were in a position to demand unconditional independence, Philadelphia. 
Brandywine, Germantown, and Saratoga. In July 1777, British General John Burgoyne led the Saratoga campaign south from Quebec through Lake Champlain and recaptured Fort Ticonderoga, intending to divide New England, including control of the Hudson River. However, General Howe in British occupied New York City blundered, taking his army south to Philadelphia, rather than up the Hudson River to join Burgoyne near Albany. Washington and Gilbert de Mottier, Marquis de Lafayette, rushed to Philadelphia to engage Howe. In the Battle of Brandywine, on September 11, 1777, Howe outmaneuvered Washington and marched unopposed into the nation's capital at Philadelphia. A Patriot attack failed against the British at Germantown in October. In upstate New York, the Patriots were led by General Horatio Gates. Concerned about Burgoyne's movement southward, Washington sent reinforcements north with Generals Benedict Arnold, his most aggressive field commander, and Benjamin Lincoln. On October 7, 1777, Burgoyne tried to take Bemis Heights, but was isolated from support by Howell. He was forced to retreat to Saratoga and ultimately surrendered after the battles of Saratoga. As Washington suspected, Gates' victory emboldened his critics. Biographer John Alden maintains, it was inevitable that the defeats of Washington's forces and the concurrent victory of the forces in Upper New York should be compared. Admiration for Washington was waning, including little credit from John Adams, Valley Forge, and Monmouth. Washington and his Continental Army of 11,000 men went into winter quarters at Valley Forge, north of Philadelphia, in December 1777. There they lost between 2,000 and 3,000 men as a result of disease and lack of food, clothing, and shelter. The British were comfortably quartered in Philadelphia, paying for supplies in pounds sterling, while Washington struggled with a devalued American paper currency. The Woodlands were soon exhausted of gain. By February, Washington was facing lowered morale and increased desertions among his troops. An internal revolt by his officers, led by Major General Thomas Conway, prompted some members of Congress to consider removing Washington from command. Washington's supporters resisted, and the matter was dropped after much deliberation. Once the plot was exposed, Conway wrote an apology to Washington, resigned, and returned to France. Washington made repeated petitions to Congress for provisions. He received a congressional delegation to check the Army's conditions and expressed the urgency of the situation, proclaiming, something must be done. Important alterations must be made. He recommended that Congress expedite supplies, and Congress agreed to strengthen and fund the Army supply lines by reorganizing the commissary department. By late February, supplies began arriving. Meanwhile, Baron Friedrich Wilhelm von Steuben's incessant drilling transformed Washington's recruits into a disciplined fighting force by the end of winter camp. For his services, Washington promoted von Steuben to Major General and made him Chief of Staff. In early 1778, the French responded to Burgoyne's defeat and entered into a treaty of alliance with the Americans. Congress ratified the treaty in May, which amounted to a French declaration of war against Britain. In May 1778, Howard resigned and was replaced by Sir Henry Clinton. The British evacuated Philadelphia for New York, but June and Washington summoned a war council of American and French generals. He chose a partial attack on the retreating British at the Battle of Monmouth. Generals Charles Lee and Lafayette moved with 4,000 men without Washington's knowledge and bungled their first attack on June 28. Washington relieved Lee and achieved a draw after an expansive battle. At nightfall, the British continued their retreat to New York, and Washington moved his army outside the city. Monmouth was Washington's last battle in the north, West Point Espionage. Washington became America's first spymaster by designing an espionage system against the British. In 1778, Major Benjamin Talmadge formed the Copa Ring at Washington's direction to covertly collect information about the British in New York. Washington had disregarded incidents of disloyalty by Benedict Arnold, who had distinguished himself in many campaigns, including the invasion of Quebec and the Battle of Saratoga. 
In 1780, Arnold began supplying British spymaster John Andre with sensitive information intended to compromise Washington and capture West Point, a key American defensive position on the Hudson River. Historians Nathaniel Philbrick and Ron Chernow noted possible reasons for Arnold's defection to be his anger at losing promotions to junior officers or repeated slights from Congress. He was also deeply in debt, profiteering from the war, and disappointed by Washington's lack of support during his eventual court-martial. After repeated requests, Washington agreed to give Arnold command of West Point in August. On September 21, Arnold met Andre and gave him plans to take over the garrison. While returning to British lines, Andre was captured by militia who discovered the plans. Upon hearing the news of Andre's capture on September 24, while waiting to greet and have breakfast with Washington, Arnold immediately fleed to the Hems Vulture, the ship that had brought Andre to West Point, and escaped to New York. Upon being told about Arnold's treason, Washington recalled the commanders positioned under Arnold at key points around the fort to prevent any complicity. He assumed personal command at West Point and reorganized its defenses. Andre's trial for espionage ended in a death sentence, and Washington offered to return him to the British in exchange for Arnold, but Clinton refused. Andre was hanged on October 2, 1780, despite his request for a firing squad to deter other spies, Southern Theater and Yorktown. In late 1778, General Clinton shipped 3,000 troops from New York to Georgia and launched a Southern invasion against Savannah, reinforced by 2,000 British and Loyalist troops. They repelled an attack by American patriots and French naval forces, which bolstered the British war effort. In June 1778, Iroquois warriors joined with Loyalist Rangers led by Walter Butler and killed more than 200 frontiersmen, laying waste to the Wyoming Valley in northeastern Pennsylvania. In mid-1779, in response to this and other attacks on New England towns, Washington ordered General John Sullivan to lead an expedition to force the Iroquois out of New York by effecting the total destruction and devastation of their villages and taking their women and children hostage. The expedition systematically destroyed Iroquois villages and food stocks and forced at least 5,036 Iroquois to flee to British Canada. The campaign directly killed a few hundred Iroquois, but according to historian Rhiannon Coeller, the net effect was to reduce the Iroquois by half. They became unable to survive the harsh winter of 1779-1780. Some historians now describe the campaign as a genocide. Washington's troops went into quarters at Morristown, New Jersey, for their worst winter of the war, with temperatures well below freezing. New York Harbor was frozen, snow covered the ground for weeks, and the troops again lacked provisions. In January 1780, Clinton assembled 12,500 troops and attacked Charlestown, South Carolina, defeating General Benjamin Lincoln. By June, they occupied the South Carolina Piedmont. Clinton returned to New York and left 8,000 troops under the command of General Charles Cornwallis. Congress replaced Lincoln with Horatio Gates. After his defeat in the Battle of Camden, Gates was replaced by Nathaniel Greene, Washington's initial choice, but the British had firm control of the South. Washington was reinvigorated, however, when Lafayette returned from France with more ships, men, and supplies, and 5,000 veteran French troops led by Marshal Rochambeau arrived at Newport, Rhode Island in July 1780. French naval forces then landed, led by Admiral de Grasse. Washington's army went into winter quarters at New Windsor, New York in December 1780. He urged Congress and state officials to expedite provisions so the army would not continue to struggle under the same difficulties they have hitherto endured. On March 1, 1781, Congress ratified the Articles of Confederation but the government that took effect on March 2 did not have the power to levy taxes, and it loosely held the states together. General Clinton sent Benedict Arnold, now a British Brigadier General with 1,700 troops, to Virginia to capture Portsmouth and conduct raids on Patriot forces. Washington responded by sending Lafayette South to counter Arnold's efforts. Washington initially hoped to bring the fight to New York, drawing off British forces from Virginia and ending the war there but Rochambeau advised him that Cornwallis in Virginia was the better target. De Grasse's fleet arrived off the Virginia coast, cutting off British retreat. Seeing the advantage, Washington made a feint towards Clinton in New York, then headed south to Virginia. 
Yorktown. The siege of Yorktown was a decisive victory by the combined forces of the Continental Army, commanded by Washington, the French Army commanded by General Comte de Rochambeau, and the French Navy commanded by Admiral de Grasse. On August 19, the march to Yorktown led by Washington and Rochambeau began, which is known now as the celebrated march. Washington was in command of an army of 7,800 Frenchmen, 3,100 militia, and 8,000 Continentals. Inexperienced in siege warfare, he often deferred to the judgment of General Rochambeau and relied on his advice. Despite this, Rochambeau never challenged Washington's authority as the battle's commanding officer. By late September, Patriot French forces surrounded Yorktown, trapped the British Army, and prevented British reinforcements from Clinton in the north, while the French Navy emerged victorious at the Battle of the Chesapeake. The final American offensive began with a shot fired by Washington. The siege ended with a British surrender on October 19, 1781. Over 7,000 British soldiers became prisoners of war. Washington negotiated the terms of surrender for two days, and the official signing ceremony took place on October 19. Cornwallis claimed illness and was absent, sending General Charles O'Hara as his proxy. As a gesture of goodwill, Washington held a dinner for the American, French, and British generals, all of whom fraternized on friendly terms and identified with one another as members of the same professional military caste. Afterwards, Washington moved the army to New Windsor, New York, where they remained stationed until the Treaty of Paris was signed on September 3, 1783, formally ending the war. Although the peace treaty did not happen for two years following the end of the battle, Yorktown proved to be the last significant battle or campaign of the Revolutionary War, with the British Parliament agreeing to cease hostilities in March 1782. Demobilization and Resignation When peace negotiations began in April 1782, both the British and French began gradually evacuating their forces. With the American Treasury empty, unpaid and mutinous soldiers forced the adjournment of Congress. In March 1783, Washington successfully calmed the Newburgh Conspiracy, a planned immunity by American officers. Congress promised each a five-year bonus. Washington submitted an account of $450,000 in expenses which he had advanced to the Army, equivalent to $9.15 million in 2020-20. The account was settled, though it was allegedly vague about large sums and included expenses his wife had incurred through visits to his headquarters. The following month, a congressional committee led by Alexander Hamilton began adapting the army for peacetime. In August 1783, Washington gave the army's perspective to the committee in his sentiments on a peace establishment which advised Congress to keep a standing army, create a national militia of separate state units, and establish a navy and a national military academy. The Treaty of Paris was signed on September 3, 1783, and Britain officially recognized American independence. Washington disbanded his army, giving a farewell address to his soldiers on November 2. During this time, Washington oversaw the evacuation of British forces in New York and was greeted by parades and celebrations. Along with Governor George Clinton, he took formal possession of the city on November 25. In early December 1783, Washington bade farewell to his officers at France's Tavern and resigned as Commander-in-Chief soon thereafter. In a final appearance in uniform, he gave a statement to the Congress. I consider it an indispensable duty to close this last solemn act of my official life by commending the interests of our dearest country to the protection of Almighty God and those who have the superintendence of them to his holy keeping. Washington's resignation was acclaimed at home and abroad and showed a skeptical world that the new republic would not degenerate into chaos. The same month, Washington was appointed president, general of the Society of the Cincinnati, a newly established hereditary fraternity of Revolutionary War officers. He served in this capacity for the remainder of his life. Early Republic 1783-1789 Returned to Mount Vernon. Washington was longing to return home after spending just 10 days at Mount Vernon out of eight cone years of war. He arrived on Christmas Eve, delighted to be free of the bustle of a camp and the busy scenes of public life. He was a celebrity and was feted during a visit to his mother at Fredericksburg. In February 1784, 
and he received a constant stream of visitors wishing to pay their respects at Mount Vernon. Washington reactivated his interest in the Great Dismal Swamp and Potomac Canal projects begun before the war, though neither paid him any dividends, and he undertook a 34-day, 680-mile, 1090 chem, trip to check on his land holdings in the Ohio country. He oversaw the completion of the remodeling work at Mount Vernon, which transformed his residence into the mansion that survives to this day. Although his financial situation was not strong, creditors paid him in depreciated wartime currency, and he owed significant amounts in taxes and wages. Mount Vernon had made no profit during his absence, and he saw persistently poor crop yields due to pestilence and poor weather. His estate recorded its 11th year running at a deficit in 1787, and there was little prospect of improvement. To make his estate profitable again, Washington undertook a new landscaping plan and succeeded in cultivating a range of fast-growing trees and native shrubs. He also began breeding mules after being gifted a Spanish jack by King Charles I of Spain in 1784. There were few mules in the United States at that time, and he believed that they would revolutionize agriculture and transportation. Constitutional Convention of 1787. Before returning to private life in June 1783, Washington called for a strong union. Though he was concerned that he might be criticized for meddling in civil matters, he sent a circular letter to the states, maintaining that the Articles of Confederation was no more than a rope of sand. He believed the nation was on the verge of anarchy and confusion, was vulnerable to foreign intervention, and that a national constitution would unify the states under a strong central government. When Shays' rebellion erupted in Massachusetts over taxation, Washington was further convinced that a national constitution was needed. Some nationalists feared that the new republic had descended into lawlessness, and they met on September 11, 1786, at Annapolis to ask Congress to revise the Articles of Confederation. One of their biggest efforts was getting Washington to attend. Congress agreed to a constitutional convention to be held in Philadelphia in spring 1787, with each state to send delegates. On December 4, 1786, Washington was chosen to lead the Virginia delegation, but he declined on December 21. He had concerns about the legality of the convention and consulted James Madison, Henry Knox, and others. They persuaded him to attend as his presence might induce reluctant states to send delegates and smooth the way for the ratification process while also giving legitimacy to the convention. On March 28, Washington told Governor Edmund Randolph that he would attend the convention but made it clear that he was urged to attend. Washington arrived in Philadelphia on May 9, 1787, though a quorum was not attained until May 25. Benjamin Franklin nominated Washington to preside over the convention, and he was unanimously elected to serve as President General. The convention's state-mandated purpose was to revise the Articles of Confederation, and the new government would be established when the resulting document was duly confirmed by the several states. Randolph introduced Madison's Virginia Plan on May 27, the third day of the convention. It called for an entirely new constitution and a sovereign national government, which Washington highly recommended. On July 10, Washington wrote to Alexander Hamilton, I almost despair of seeing a favorable issue to the proceedings of our convention, and do therefore repent having had any agency in the business. Nevertheless, he lent his prestige to the work of the other delegates, unsuccessfully lobbying many to support ratification of the Constitution, such as anti-federalist Edmund Randolph and George Mason. The final version was voted on and signed by 39 of 55 delegates on September 17, 1787, Chancellor William Mary. In 1788, the Board of Visitors of the College of William Mary decided to re-establish the position of Chancellor and elected Washington to the office on January 18. The college rector Samuel Griffin wrote to Washington inviting him to the post, and in a letter dated April 30, 1788, Washington accepted the position of the 14th Chancellor of the College of William Mary. He continued to serve through his presidency until his death on December 14, 1799. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and ring that bell to stay updated on all our latest content. 
Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.